Good morning, everyone. All right, uh, welcome back to the show that never ends, day two. Um, so uh, we're going to kick off this morning with uh, uh, several reports. Uh, first, we'll hear from the uh, Subcommittee on Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships, the STEP uh, uh, Committee on the Engines Type 2 finalists, uh, and then we'll hear from the uh, Merit Review uh, Commission, which will provide an update uh, on their work. Uh, we'll also be joined by Rebecca Kaiser. Remember, she's the Chief Security uh, uh, Strategy Officer for NSF, and she'll give us an update on uh, some of the work to establish the Research Security and Integrity Information Sharing and Analysis Organization. <gasps> Secure. Um, and then we'll talk some about an update on Saffron Antarctica. Uh, we'll hear from the IG uh, on that topic as well. Uh, and then there'll be some additional committee reports, and we'll end with uh, executive plenary. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor to Dario uh, for the STIP report. Thank you, Dan, and good morning to all. Uh, I'm Dario Gill, chair of NSV Subcommittee on Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships, or STIP. The subcommittee consists of Roger Beachy, Heather Wilson, Suresh Garimela, and myself. For nearly two years, this subcommittee of the Committee on Strategy has worked closely with the TIP directorate leadership to hone the strategy for TIP and its signature regional innovation engines program. So it's my pleasure this morning to invite Erwin Gianchandani, NSF Assistant Director for Technology, Innovation and Partnerships, to give an update on the engines competition and NSF's recent announcement of the type two competition finalists. All right. Thanks very much, Dario. I appreciate that. Uh, and good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you all today. And I appreciate the opportunity to provide an update on the engines program and specifically the type two competition. Uh, while we're pulling up the slides, uh, maybe I'll just take one moment here to acknowledge the uh, effort, the time, the effort, the collaboration, and I think the great input and support that we've received from STIP over the course of the last really almost two years, uh, both in terms of the design and development of the directorate, uh, but then also the design, the development, and now the implementation of the NSF Engines program. I think we've said this repeatedly, but it's been a really effective partnership, and we very much, uh, I think, appreciated and benefited all of us from that partnership. Uh, okay, so if we can, oh, I guess I do get a clicker. All right. Uh, so just as a, as a bit of a reminder, uh, in terms of uh, where we stand with respect to the engines program, All right, trying again? No, nope. still hear it. <clears throat> okay, trying again? Can folks hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, so just to kind of level set one uh, one more time, as, as we always do when we talk about the ENGINES program, a little bit of the trajectory that we have been on. Uh, so the ENGINES program is one that we launched uh, almost 16 months ago now. Uh, it was May of last year when we first issued the funding opportunity, the broad agency announcement, uh, after much conversation and discussion, as I mentioned, with STIP. Uh, that funding opportunity uh, called for the very first step to be a set of concept outlines that would come in from the community. Uh, you've heard us talk about the numbers of concept outlines and the breadth and diversity of those outlines, but they were really intended to be short uh, three to five page write-ups that spoke to the region of service, the team that was coming together, as well as the uh, topic areas for those corresponding regions of service. And our objective by publishing those concept outlines uh, at the end of July, beginning of August of last year, was really to try to encourage teaming, which we have now seen effectively, we think, through the proposals that we have subsequently received to this program. Um, the other important design element here, beyond sort of that transparency and that teaming that we were really encouraging, was to run parallel tracks of type ones and type twos. Type ones being the planning or development grants, and type twos being the full proposals uh, for engines. Uh, the development grants <coughs> are at the level of up to a million dollars for up to a couple of years of support. 
really to try to prepare a region and a team for a future engines competition. Uh, and the type two engines proposals, we have described them as up to up to $160 million over up to 10 years. Uh, but we have also stressed that uh, when we make these awards, the initial awards will be for a couple of years for $15 million. Uh, and we will reassess at the point that we get to uh, the midst of year two to be able to see exactly uh, where things are on a project by project basis, but then also as part of the overall portfolio. Um, so this is part of our strategy to meet people where they are. Uh, some regions, some teams were primed for a type one, and some regions, some teams are primed for a type two. Uh, and we have seen that to some degree in the proposals that we have received as well. <clears throat> in terms of where we are then is where that uh, star is, that blue star. So we announced the Type 1 awards uh, in May of this year. Uh, I'll talk about those very briefly on the next slide. And we are currently in the midst of the competition for the Type 2s, having just announced the finalists earlier this month. Uh, so this is just, again, a refresher. Uh, these are the 44 uh, NSF Engine Development Awards that we funded uh, back at the beginning of May. Uh, the blue engine symbols, blue and orange engine symbols, correspond to the uh, lead institutions, the locations of the lead institutions. The states and territories shaded in blue correspond to those that are covered by these 44 engines. Uh, you see that we have covered 46 states and territories by this uh, map, by these awards, and you see on the right-hand side as well, the various um, topical areas. Uh, there's one uh, count for each of the 44 uh, uh, circles that you see on this map. So essentially, what is the primary area of emphasis for a particular uh, uh, engine, uh, ranging from sustainable energy to advanced agriculture to cybersecurity and so on. Uh, I'll note that with this portfolio, we covered all of the key technology areas that were called out in the Chips and Science Act legislation, as well as the national societal and geostrategic areas that were also called out in that legislation. Uh, so now, moving forward beyond the Type 1s to the Type 2s. Sorry, Erwin, just one uh, on the previous sure. one, a point of clarification on that topic of the technology areas. Maybe you can comment on why AI is not on the oh, list, sure. since I'm sure it will be top of mind for people. Sure. So again, these are the primary areas of emphasis for each of the uh, engines. And so if you add up those numbers, you get to 44. Uh, but it's important to note that when we think about, for example, uh, healthcare innovations, there are a number of key technology areas that are layered under healthcare innovations, for instance, AI certainly being foremost among those. So in fact, if you look at the dashboard for this portfolio, you will see that uh, a number of these projects touch AI, for example, or benefit from AI. Uh, similarly, other technology areas that are covered as well. Um, we, we, if, if we focus in on AI, nearly every single one of these projects would be would, would have some intersectionality with that. Yes, sir. Erwin, good morning. Just good morning. wondering, with the states that did not receive any engines, Utah, West Virginia, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, just uh, and Massachusetts, non-competitive. Uh, so in in uh, for, for the most part, uh, uh, that is that is the case. So what we sought to do was fund every single project that was above bar for, for mm -hmm. us, and that's how we got to the 44 Engine Development Awards. Um, there were a couple of states that did not submit, uh, okay. that were not involved in the submissions, and then there were a couple of states, as you say, that, that were not included in the above bar portfolio. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's really important on that point, Victor, to also consider the type two geography as well. Uh, we, we won't cover all the states when we combine type ones and type twos, but when you look at the type two finalists, you will see that we will add additional states that are not in the mix here. Uh, by the way, one other thing, since you talked about uh, uh, states and geography, I'll just note that uh, the, some of the uh, characteristics of this portfolio, uh, about 40% uh, of the projects are led by EPSCOR jurisdictions. Uh, about seven of the projects are led by uh, MSIs, minority serving institutions, including uh, so HBCUs and other minority serving institutions. Uh, and about 20% of this portfolio uh, is, from, uh, is led by organizations that are new to the NSF funding ecosystem. Okay, <clears throat> so moving on, sort of uh, closing the door in some sense on the uh, discussion of the type ones, moving on now to the discussion of the type twos. 
Uh, what you see here is uh, new information essentially since the last NSB meeting. Uh, so we were announcing this right at the time of the last NSB meeting. So we've announced 34 engine semifinalists. You see the topic areas that, uh, I'm sorry, you see the, the, the locations and the uh, states and territories that are covered by those. Uh, but I'm actually going to move forward even further to the 16 NSF engines finalists that we announced earlier uh, this month. Uh, it was August 1st or 2nd that we made this announcement. Uh, and so what you see here in the blue dots are the lead organizations, and then you see the states in the uh, shading of blue that are covered by these engines finalists. Uh, 16 finalists that span 22 states. Um, you can go to the link in the upper right-hand corner to take a look at the dashboard and explore each of these teams, the topic areas, the regions of service, as well as the partners who have come together for each of these teams. Uh, the one thing that I want to highlight here is you know, we're, we're tracking very closely how we're doing with regard to um, EPS score with regard to new organizations, some of the characteristics, Victor, that you and I have talked about in the past, for instance. Um, and so you see that about a quarter of the finalists are led by uh, organizations in EPSCOR jurisdictions. Uh, about eight of the 22 uh, 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 states covered in this portfolio are EPSCOR states. Um, those numbers, I want to stress, track with the proposals that we received. Uh, as a matter of fact, the success rate for EPSCOR jurisdictions is uh, ever, ever so slightly higher than that of the fuller population. Just uh, one additional question. This is great. Any coordination at this point in time with, they've got a new director for the awards that will be coming out of the Department of Commerce. So there are a number of people and, and universities and consortium. Any coordination between what you're doing and what they're doing so overall, there's somewhat of a coordinated and balanced government approach. Tremendous coordination with our colleagues at the Department of Commerce and the Economic Development Administration. Uh, so as a matter of fact, just uh, I think it was last week uh, that we announced an MOU that has been signed between NSF and EDA, uh, specifically to ensure that we're able to share data and information about our finalists and uh, and they're able to share data as well with us too. Um, also, if you look at the legislation that authorized the uh, uh, regional tech hubs program at the Department of Commerce, it calls for as an eligibility criterion, uh, among those organizations that are eligible are regional innovation engines awardees. Uh, and so trying to be able to provide that information to EDA now at this point, as they're starting to go through their review process for uh, proposals for their tech hubs, um, um, their designation grants and their other grants that they're making is something that we have we have been embarking on for quite some time now. Uh, okay. Uh, and the other point that I wanted to make is about half of the organization leads here are new to the NSF ecosystem. And again, that's tracking with the proposal pressure that we received for this program. Um, this is the slate of finalists. This is all public. It's on that dashboard that I talked about a moment ago. Uh, you can see the lead states. You can see the topic areas. You can see the proposal titles and the organization names as well uh, that are leading these uh, efforts. Uh, you know, we, we actually have a little bit of hesitancy putting the organization name on this chart because because we really want to stress that it's not as critical who's leading. It's much more critical about the team that's coming together uh, to make these uh, programs what they are. Um, but nonetheless, we wanted to kind of highlight on this slide in one snapshot a sense of the portfolio as it stands today. Um, to the point, Dario, that you asked about earlier, the same story is true here. Uh, and there are a number of key technology areas that intersect with every single one of these projects. AI intersects with every single one of these projects. And so thus, when when we try to delineate topic, we try to delineate what is the specific focus um, of a particular project going forward. Can I use your microphone? Um, the AI is a foundational technology that cuts through many other service areas, healthcare, finance, you name it, as well as s and you might also want to see, are there other technologies mm -hmm. that are cutting? The, and the reason I say that, quantum right now is in an initial state, so that in and of itself. But there are other technologies that are maturing that people may ask you the questions, well, I don't see it up there, but things like data science and things like that, exactly. which are foundation. And you can say, hey, look, it's, you know, it's like in the sauce. It's yeah. there. Same thing. Absolutely true about data science, sensing, and wireless technologies right. as well, for instance. Uh, so I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to highlight how we got to this portfolio of 16 finalists. 
Um, in particular, we started with the proposals that we received at the end of January of this year. Uh, and we have put those proposals through sort of a, or we will have put those proposals by the time we're done through a four stage review process. Uh, I want to emphasize that the review process starts with the NSF merit review process and the board's criteria of intellectual merit and broader impacts. But we layer on top of that a set of additional criteria that are specific to this particular funding opportunity that we feel are essential for ultimately success when it comes to um, a particular engine. So in particular, as we're thinking about that, um, those additional criteria, we try to get at what are the foundational institutions and uh, what's the nature of the partnerships among those foundational institutions when it comes to the organizations that are coming together for a successful engine. Uh, what's the innovation capacity for a particular region? Uh, that includes what's the human capital or talent that already exists in that region or that's uh, flowing into that region. Thinking about the financial capital beyond potential NSF investment, what's the nature of investment by state, local, tribal organizations? What's the nature of investment by private organizations, including philanthropy? Um, what's the local infrastructure uh, for a particular uh, region of service? So is the region of service so distributed and diffuse that it's going to be hard to really be able to create a successful economic ecosystem going forward? Um, what's the uh, uh, demand within that region for an engine of this type? Do we see multiple organizations not only coming together as partners of the engine, but really seeking out something like this investment, this engine, because they feel that it will be able to contribute to the vitality of that engine in the long term. Uh, and then finally, what is the region's competitive advantage? Uh, that is something that we're really honing in on. Uh, in particular, um, uh, you know, as we think about uh, what is in that particular region, uh, whether it be uh, access to um, mining capabilities, whether it be access to uh, quantum expertise, whether it be access to other characteristics that make that region and offer that region, it's a competitive advantage relative to other regions in the country as well. So those are some of the characteristics that constitute sort of that additional layering of review criteria that we want to explore. And we're trying to do that through each of these various stages of review. So for example, uh, the very first stage of review, um, we looked specifically at the alignment with the program vision and goals. Is the proposal that's been submitted to NSF actually in alignment with the ultimate goals of the Regional Innovation Engines program? Um, for this particular stage and something that you will see throughout, in fact, uh, we tried to ensure that the reviewers looked like the uh, population of proposers and the population of eventual awardees that we're trying to seek out. In particular, we sought reviewers who have government expertise, industry and startup experience, uh, come from the investment and venture capital community, for example, uh, come from local economic development uh, agencies and have that experience as well. So really trying to go beyond sort of a, a, a more traditional uh, academic population, though we certainly had academics as part of the review population, but really trying to broaden that set of reviewers who are engaging and providing expertise. Uh, the next stage of the review, uh, again, bringing in uh, external reviewers was to really look at the integrated uh, plans, uh, strategic plans that the teams uh, put forward in terms of their regional capacity, in terms of the leadership team that was coming together, in terms of the depth of the cross-sector partnerships and so forth. Um, and through those first two stages, we narrowed it down to 34 uh, semifinalists that just completed a virtual site, uh, that just completed a virtual site visit phase. Um, the virtual site visits were conducted by NSF engineers program team members. Um, as we've talked about in the past, the program team itself comprises folks who come from backgrounds um, having uh, experience at EDA or SBA, having experience at some of the ARPAs and so on to, to complement the uh, NSF expertise. Um, and ultimately, here the goal was to really be able to understand specific concerns that were raised by the uh, review panels and the review process uh, through uh, the earlier stages and to ultimately assess the competitive advantages and the risks associated with each one of these projects. Um, I think a really important point at the virtual site visit stage was that 
in addition to what the proposers were telling us, in addition to what the reviewers were telling us, this was an opportunity for us to really be able to conduct some benchmarking and uh, further due diligence. Uh, and so in particular, we complemented what we were seeing with uh, actual data, ground truth data from a variety of different external organizations like the Economic Innovation Group, which has an index of state dynamism. Uh, and that index of state dynamism allows us to be able to look at the characteristics on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, that span what's the startup rate for a particular region? Uh, what's the growth in total firms for that region? Uh, how many patents per uh, 1,000 residents? Uh, what's the labor force participation rate and so forth to essentially uh, benchmark what we are seeing from the proposers and the reviewers with um, um, uh, data that are out there that help us to be able to construct an internal model of what we want to get to at the end of the day with these engines. So we have completed those first three stages uh, of the review process, uh, and we are embarking now on a virtual, on a in-person site visit phase, uh, phase four, which will allow us to go from our 16 finalists ultimately to our award slate. Uh, Roger. Question: uh, Did you consider, uh, did you include P uh, any of the venture industry in uh, consider what what cash was available within some some mileage of that? I mean, given that a lot of it coast coastal money goes anywhere. The money anywhere there's innovation. It, is there any condition here about uh, innovation funds being or investor funds being available in the region? Yeah. So so absolutely. We I did, didn't see it. I, we, we did. So so this is one particular uh, index, right? There are actually three indices that we are using, or three three sets of data that we're using, and one of those um, is actually one that we share with the Department of Commerce and EDA that starts to get at some of that information. Uh, so the final phase is the, as I was saying, is the site visit phase that we are embarking on starting uh, later this month and continuing over a six-week period into the middle of October. And uh, that phase is really about trying to now uh, work with the teams, get boots on the ground uh, to uh, understand sort of the local level, regional level characteristics, the meaningfulness of the partnerships and so on, and complement some of the due diligence that we have already done. Uh, so with that, uh, I will pause. Uh, happy to take additional questions, um, but we continue to be on our trajectory to be able to uh, hopefully make awards using FY23 appropriations uh, by the end of this calendar year. Okay, we have uh, just a few minutes for a few questions. Uh, I think Roger wants yeah, uh, did you find any? Uh, did, did you find to find it useful to have any of the review team, those who might have been, for example, most critical of an of a proposal, engaged in the next phases as you move through? Yeah, so that's a great question, Roger. So um, we have, uh, uh, without going into too much detail about individual reviewers, right, we have, uh, in fact, tried to leverage some expertise across multiple stages uh, because we have found that actually <coughs> to be quite useful. As a matter of fact, some of the um, reviewers who we used for the Type 1 competition, we have also um, engaged them for the Type 2 competition as well because that's been helpful in terms of calibrating and benchmarking too. Yeah, there's I had a actually, quick question. There, yeah, let's let's start with Matt, who's remote, and then we'll go to Scott and Maureen. Thank you, Armin. A quick question. I wasn't entirely clear what how the index of state dynamism is used. Kind of an interesting number, but <clears throat> for example, you've got some wide range. Some states there uh, have a very high dynamism index, Idaho, for example. Does that mean that a proposal from Idaho compared to, I don't know, um, West Virginia or something would be um, at an advantage because it's in a very dynamic state or would it be relatively at a disadvantage um, because those states don't need much help or or is it not relevant one way or the other? I, I, could you explain a little bit um, why we need to know what the, and by the way, the state is a very big place. It really depends more on the region. But anyway, assuming it's a good index, how is it used? Yeah, sure. So that's a great question, Matt. Uh, so let me answer that in the following way. Um, we've we've tried to essentially uh, benchmark what the proposers are telling us and what we're seeing from the reviewers with some of these external data sources and assets that we have uh, at our disposal. Um, it, I, I, the, the honest answer to your question, Matt, is I 
don't want to suggest that if a state is high on that index or low on that index, it suggests one thing or another in terms of an outcome. We want to be sure that at the end of the day, we have a portfolio where we have some projects that are higher risk and some projects that are uh, perhaps a bit less risky. And so we're taking into account these factors to try to ensure that um, we're doing a bit of due diligence and benchmarking relative to what we're hearing from the proposers and the reviewers. But it's not necessarily the case that only those that are high or only those that are low on a particular um, uh, uh, data set uh, are ones that we would be advancing with. As a matter of fact, right. you would so, see that in our portfolio that um, in our portfolio finalists, you will see that we actually spread that index. Okay, so the proposers don't really know if they're you're benchmarking what they tell you. They don't really know if they should stress just how terribly dynamic their state is, or they should say the opposite. Gosh, our state is really <laughs> lagging. Um, because it, it might be good or it might be bad. It could go either way. They don't really know. You're just going to check and see if you agree with what they said. That's the, yes. And I think I think the I think the more important part here is for uh, a particular proposal to sort of describe what is its context, what is its starting point, and how is it going to evolve that particular region over time. That's how we're thinking about it. Thank you. Uh, nuts and bolts question on the type ones are the contracts in place, uh, contract officers assigned, team members under contract? Yeah, so the uh, projects were funded as cooperative agreements uh, for the type ones, uh, and those cooperative agreements are all in place at this point. They were uh, in place when we announced the awards uh, or shortly thereafter in the middle of May. Uh, and in fact, we have program managers assigned with each of those projects and are ramping up now, working very closely with each of those teams. This is not just we're going to fund them for a couple of years and hope for success, but we want to work very closely with those teams to be able to be put them on the trajectory for success in the longer term. And I want to stress that success in that context uh, does not necessarily mean that they receive a type two engines award in the future. Success could mean that they are on a glide path where they get additional funding from other sources too. So there are many forms of success here at the end of the day that we want to emphasize with those teams as we work with them. Yeah, so uh, continuing on the theme of questioning uh, the utility of these benchmarks or indices that you're using, um, can you give us a sense of um, what the resolution of, of assessing progress will be based on those indices? I mean, how much noise is there in the measurement inherently so that you can or cannot detect, you know, if you saw a 2% improvement, would that be meaningful? Yeah, so I think that uh, the the indices unpack for us uh, some of the characteristics that you saw on this slide, for example, and being able to track sort of the evolution on each of those characteristics over time. I think we we part of what we want to do, and this comes back to sort of being able to collect data from these teams on our own as well and aggregate those data and evaluate progress over time. Our intent is to try to be able to take snapshots of time on a quarterly and then annual basis, understanding that some of these numbers will change not as rapidly. They will change over many years' horizon. Yeah, I guess um, maybe I wasn't as clear as I, I could have been. Um, so, for example, housing permits per thousand residents, if if that uh, number is varying on an annual basis by 40 percent, will you be able to detect over a three year period any improvement against a background of, of high variation? Yeah. So so that's a that's so, so maybe the way I would answer that, Maureen, I, I hear you on that question is um, we should talk a little bit more deeply about that. Uh, I think that when you look at the evolution of these indices over time, you do see trends in the states where where the states are 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 adjusting where they are being placed over time uh, based over a year over year basis, as a matter of fact. So we can we can talk more about that in depth. Um, I, I just make a meta comment. Um, you, you've been charging hard and fast to roll out an impressive portfolio of programs and activities. And um, I just want to say I'm always impressed that if if your heart rate is elevated, it's not it's not apparent. <laughs> um, and so the meta comment is that I, I I hope that when you get 
to the end of this sort of major first stage of rolling out TIP um, after you make the final Type 2 awards, that there will be an opportunity for you and your team to do a bit of retrospective, right, to kind of assess what have you wrought <laughs> and what are the lessons learned. Yeah, Kevon, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think my team certainly could not agree with you more on that. There's no doubt about that. Um, I, I would also just say, since since you mentioned the team, I, I, you know, I, I I put the face on this. Uh, the director and I, I think the director would agree with this. You know, we have a really incredible team that is um, driving this and driving what I hope will be success for this program in the in the medium to longer terms. And so, kudos to them for the pace that they're keeping up with. Uh, but yes, we will get to the end of this, and we will take uh, take an opportunity to not only um, deconstruct what are the lessons learned, but how does that inform the next opportunity and our thinking with the next competition for this program you know in these kinds of things i just want to say this as a general comment when the board says good things about people i'm so grateful that you said what you said it means a lot to the agency folks and even a letter of commendation to the people not to me not to the urban we don't look for that but i think to the team it can mean a lot because they look up to the board to all of you they take every comments that you make seriously. I want to assure you that. And so by the same token, every bit of accolades where appropriate, where deserved, not, not just throwing it away, but where it truly is richly deserved. I think this program, if I can say it as a past board member, not as a director right now, is phenomenal what has, accom what has been accomplished in such a short time. That's credit to the all people that have worked in this program. So I just want to put it out there for the board to consider these kinds of things that we need to do more of uh, as a board. Now I'm talking like a board member as part of the board. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dorada, you're going to get the last word and I'm going to hand it back thank to you. Dario. Um, so I noticed several of those um, phase two um, engines are multi-state. And I just wonder how the, the indices that you are using for evaluation, how do that combine into such a, a significantly large engine? And second part of my question is how do you assure uh, engagement and support by the local government uh, and also economic development? Because I understand it would be needed for sustainability, right? Yeah. So so they are indeed multi-state. And, and I'll just note uh, on that point, one of the things that we are, so obviously we're looking at the index scores and, and some of the data that we have uh, across those different states and seeing how we can potentially incorporate those together. So that that's not an easy process by any means, but it's certainly something that the team has been trying to do as they look Look at these proposals. Um, part of the um, reconciling that we've had to do is to think about the appropriate size of a region of service. Um, too large can allow things to become too diffuse, too small, and uh, are we really attaining the impact that we want to have with the resources that we're providing? And so I will tell you that that's been a point, uh, since you asked about it, that's been a point that's been of, of, of uh, great focus and discussion among the team. Um, the second question, I'm sorry, can you remind me the second? Oh, the engagement of state and local. Um, with regard to that, uh, so that is actually one of the key pieces of the forthcoming site visits, uh, is to be able to meet directly with the state, local, uh, tribal, governmental organizations that are associated with each of these teams, and to truly understand the um, level of engagement, the depth of engagement, and the commitment on the part of those uh, constituencies with regard to each of these projects. All right, so uh, Erwin, on behalf of the board, I want to, you know, thank and congratulate you and the entire TIP team uh, for launching, exactly, the, the entire effort for launching the new engines program and, uh, and a myriad of other programs that are under TIP. We're really all eager to see the outcomes and, uh, of the next phase of the engines competition. And this concludes my STIP report. Thank you, Dan. All right, thanks. Uh, I'll just echo what Pont said. Uh, a lot of these things, um, uh, the duck looks like it's gliding quietly on the water, but there's a lot of furious paddling going on underneath, and uh, we, we do appreciate that. Um, and I apologize because I'm uh, I think I'm the reason that we are behind uh, because I, I we started late. That's my bad. Uh, we're going to move on to um, the uh, Commission on Merit Review. Uh, Steve Wilward is traveling, and so uh, 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 as Vice Chair Wanda Ward is uh, going to give us uh, uh, the update. So, Wanda. Thank you, Dan, and good morning, everyone. 
uh, as Dan mentions, our chair, Steve Willard, uh, is traveling, but he is with us virtually, I believe, uh, if not mistaken. Uh, the NSB NSF Commission on Merit Review has had a busy schedule since our last board meeting in May. Since that time, we've maintained our cadence of twice monthly meetings, whether in open, closed, or retreat. During our May 24th open meeting, we were joined by Dr. Susan Reno, the executive director of the Center for Advancing Research Impact in Society, or ARIS, to discuss potential areas of examination within the broader impacts criterion, including novelty, societal outcomes, and persistent misunderstandings around this criterion. Next. During a retreat on June 14th, the commission received a very informative overview of the merit, the NSF merit review process from OIA staff. The following day, commission Ch chair Steve Willard and I met with the congressionally mandated committee on equal opportunities in, CIOS, in science and engineering or CIOS which advises NSF on policies, programs, practices, and activities to broaden participation in STEM. During our conversation, we spoke with them about the merit review criteria, opportunities for broadening participation within merit review policies and processes, and strategies for addressing potential barriers to participation within merit review. During our next open meeting on June 28th, we were joined by the University of Minnesota Associate Professor of Strategic Management and Entrepreneurship, Russell Funk, to discuss potential areas of examination within the intellectual merit criterion, including incremental versus transformative research and the potential for the use of science of science techniques in assessing the effectiveness of merit review criteria. In July, we had two very productive retreats to discuss our work plan and timeline, which I'll discuss further in a few moments. And finally, just two days ago, we hosted a panel on federal agency review processes moderated by Commission member Kayvon Stassen, representatives from NIH, DOE, NASA, DARPA, and ARPA-H joined us in discussing proposal review policies, policy implementation, and successes and challenges. As of yesterday, we've already had over 100 views on our YouTube page. As a reminder, the commission has been charged by the board to assess the efficacy of the current merit review policy and associated criteria and processes at supporting NSF's mission to create new knowledge, fully empower diverse talent, participation, uh, talent to participate in STEM, and benefit society by translating knowledge into solutions. To accomplish this task, the commission agreed to the work plan located in tab 12.2.2.1 of your diligent board book. Our commission seeks to address two overarching questions. One, to what extent are the merit review process and criteria as currently understood, implemented, and assessed, resulting in awards for research and education that achieve NSF's mission. Secondly, are charges to the merit review, changes to the merit review process and criteria, their implementation or their assessment needed to achieve NSF's mission? We will attempt to answer our questions through the following seven step process. One, reach consensus on the goals, objectives, and, and policy questions of the merit review reexamination timeline estimate, which we've already completed. 
develop topics and questions for data collections, including surveys and listening sessions. Recently, our commission agreed to a list of areas for examination, which we will share in a closed report out later today. Development of questions in those areas will be done in partnership with the contract, which we hope to secure very soon. Three, conduct research and, con and consult stakeholders to assess current criteria and potential changes to current criteria implementation, interpretation, and utilization by proposers, reviewers, and NSF program staff. This process has already begun through listening sessions. In addition to the listening session we conducted in March with broader impacts professionals at the ARIS Summit and a discussion with broadening participation experts at the June CIOS meeting, we also plan to conduct a listening session with Big Ten University leaders um, on the merit review process uh, next month. With contractor support, we will also collect data from internal and external stakeholders through surveys, requests for information, text analyses, and other requests for information to NSF, including expected updates from OIA to the Committee on Oversight on, pil on pilots conducted in response to board resolutions on reviewer training and placement and the placement of broader impacts experts on committees of visitors. Four, analyze the information collected to identify policy issues and opportunities. This step will involve the analysis of information we have gathered through various sources to begin developing preliminary policy recommendations. Five and six, refine policy recommendations, develop implementation and accountability recommendations. As a reminder, our work is framed within three areas, policy, implementation, and accountability, with policy being our top priority uh, as the other two areas uh, flow from policy. Our recommendations to the board will be in the policy space. However, we will aim to deliver implementation and accountability suggestions in support of our policy recommendations. Steps five and six will involve refinement of preliminary recommendations and suggestions informed by contractor data analyses, public feedback, and board and NSF feedback. An important uh, it's important to note, uh, to make here, is that uh, during our planning discussions, we also agreed to adjust our timeline, which is located in tab 12.2.2 of your diligent book. Temporary and long-term staffing issues have presented significant challenges requiring revisions to our timeline. This examination is an important process, and we want to make sure to give ourselves enough time to do it right. Therefore, instead of delivering final policy recommendations and implementation and accountability suggestions, in May 2024, we plan to deliver preliminary recommendations and suggestions. And seven, produce and publish a commission report. Initially, we plan to also deliver a final report by May 2024. While we, still, while we will still deliver a final report, we've agreed to aim for the end of 2024. Finally, as much as possible, we'd like this to be a transparent process and we invite feedback and suggestions from the public. Please reach out with your questions or comments via email as listed uh, on the slide, Merit Review Commission at nsf.gov. And to learn more about activities regarding this reexamination, visit www.nsf.gov.gov backslash NSB. 
We especially encourage board members, as well as members of the public, to watch Monday's, this past Monday's, federal agency panel discussion on the NSF YouTube page. Mr. Chair, this concludes the Commission on Merit Review Report. I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Wanda. And I see Suresh Karamella has a, a question. Just a quick question, Wanda. Thank you. You know, your own experience at NSF is certainly very helpful as you look at this. Um, I was curious, because TIP is such a big and exciting part of what we're doing now, and we just had a presentation from Erwin, um, and the sort of review process for that is very different from anything else NSF does. How is that playing a role in the way you're rethinking the merit review process? And I apologize I didn't watch yesterday's or day before yesterday's uh, YouTube thing. You've been a little busy since, uh, <laughs> since yesterday, uh, Suresh. It's an excellent question. I think um, this is a recurring question about how TIP, given the uniqueness of this particular program and initiative, how it relates to the current merit review uh, process. We are actively planning to invite TIP uh, to have a focused conversation with the entire commission around this, and we will certainly report back out to the entire board with regard to that. What's very interesting about that, uh, since the merit review process has not been examined in over a decade, it's highly timely. And our horizon is at least decadal. We're not looking to just torque uh, the, the process, but we want to take as deep a dive and as broad a dive, actually, as we possibly can. And this entails looking out to the future of what NSF uh, might look like and what the as best we can assess now, uh, what the uh, merit r review criteria need to look like to entail all that NSF supports. Great question, though. So get ready, Erwin. Ir <laughs> we look forward to talking to you soon. <laughs> all right. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Keep on. I, just a comment as a member of the of the commission, and in the spirit of the part the NSB NSF partnership, this is a joint commission, and it's been a real privilege and pleasure to have the real engagement of the NSF staff, uh, who are who are members of the commission. Um, you know, on the NSB side, you know, we, policy and principles are are our remit. At the end of the day, the day to day implementation and stewardship of the merit review process, which is the heart and soul of what we do, um, you know, comes down to the staff to be the institutional memory and, and executors. And so to have their partnership and involvement with us has been, has been really important and meaningful. I think that reinforces, uh, Kayvon, the point that uh, Ponch was just making in reference to uh, TIP, the work that's been done uh, in any uh, feedback, constructive and positive feedback that we can provide uh, the dir director and his staff about NSF engagement is uh, a high priority for us also in this joint collaboration. And actually, some of us have already taken the liberty to let you and your staff know ab about uh, how much we appreciate your appointment of the NSF representatives. Much. Just a plus one for what Keevan said, but uh, the title slide of our presentation says NSB, NSB. It doesn't say NSB, NSF. <laughs> well, you see, Roger, that was a test to see how closely people were reading, and you passed 100%. <laughs> that will be duly noted and corrected. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Well, I, I sometimes tell students that you know, we're in a business where the questions don't change, but the answers do. Uh, and so it's important to keep asking the basic questions about what we do and why we do it. And um, and as circumstances change, they, uh, um, the, the approaches uh, um, necessarily change as, as well, even though our objectives of advancing the interests of the country don't. I do want to give a shout out to, to Portia for uh, her help um, uh, with uh, this process uh, as well. Um, any Anything else, Wanda? Yeah, Marvi. So just, just one quick point um, on the merit review. 
Um, and this, I think, became uh, one of the uh, um, questions and comments that we actually discussed in one of the meetings. Sometimes it's important to consider, you know, and include in the conversation, in the discussions, the universities that have a lot of NSF funding, right, of course. But it is also, um, it, I encourage you to include people that actually do not have um, NSF funding and or for whatever reason have moved away from NSF funding, you know, to understand like what reasons they have, right, to um, not propose to NSF and maybe use um, preferably other agencies. Um, you know a number of professors that, you know, in the past they have used NSF and they have actually moved on to use uh, funding from other agencies. What are the reasons, right? The other thing too is I encourage the commission to also check out not only um, what review processes are used by other agencies, but what review processes are used outside of government agencies. Um, and by uh, potentially, you know, industry and other, you know, potential partners, uh, foundations, exactly. That's a really good point, um, Bev. And so um, maybe, you know, kind of think outside the box, right? Um, make it simple, but also think outside the box. The review, merit review process is very important to NSF, which I understand. But we should probably like challenge ourselves to see, okay, how can we make it? better um, mm -hmm. in alignment to the mission of NSF, but also maybe following more modern ways of um, assessment. Thank you. Maureen, uh, your hand is still up. Is that a lingering or a question? Uh, it, was a, it was a question. Okay, and, go for it then. Um, uh, Wanda, could you, based on uh, your discussions with broad groups at this point, can you give us a sense of um, where are the NSF's understanding of the broader impacts criteria sits relative to other agencies and other organizations that that take a similar approach. Um, I think I think this has been you know one of the tougher areas of merit review because it it has seemed so nebulous. And I'm I'm hopeful that some of some of our partners and collaborators might have might have pinned that down a little bit better than than we have. Uh, that, too, is an excellent uh, question, Maureen, and I would answer that in a, in a couple of ways. Looking to the future again, and I've referenced ARIS, uh, its leading national stakeholder group, particularly on the broader impacts uh, uh, criterion, and in fact, they are issuing imminently a report on the evolution of broader impacts at NSF and beyond. And one of the things that they are recommending expressly uh, is consideration of interagency discussions and engagement and possible collaboration about what broader impacts means across the, the federal agencies. We've just begun uh, this uh, a little bit on the uh, discussion this past uh, Monday with the five federal agencies. Uh, and ARIS is actually, if I'm not mistaken, recommending broader impacts criterion be adopted in, you know, tailored appropriately across federal agencies. That is very good. If, if I might speak back to Marvie's excellent point, uh, and that is casting a broader net and getting input um, beyond the usual cast of characters. Some of the things that we are probing and will be probing further, Marvi, um, is reaching out particularly to types of institutions uh, that have not been quite so well represented. It's encouraging to see in recent report outs, for example, MSIs, but we will in listening sessions be hearing from MSI administrators and faculty, et cetera, their take on the NSF merit review process broadly, but certainly looking to hear from them about um, broader impacts as well. And on another dimension, uh, this issue that you raise uh, is so important because of course, we want to always uh, be aggressive in supporting and attracting proposals that tap into high risk 
uh, high reward, blue sky kinds of activities. And many agencies wrestle with that, uh, including uh, us uh, here at the NSF. So thank you very much for uh, those suggestions, which are duly noted, including your point about uh, assessment. All right. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you all. We need to, to move on um, to our uh, next agenda item. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Rebecca Kaiser, as I mentioned, is going to give us uh, an update on uh, that mouthful, secure. Uh, the uh, um, Research Security and Integrity Information Sharing and Analysis Organization. Uh, so, Rebecca, over to you. Thank you. Good morning. I have a very long title, Chief of Research Security Strategy and Policy, and a very long name of our center that we're establishing. And so for that reason, of course, we are um, announcing our name of this Research Security and Integrity Information Sharing and Analysis Organization. It's a mouthful. So we're going to be calling it SECURE. SECURE stands for the safeguarding the entire community in the US research ecosystem. As a reminder, um, we uh, have been pursuing research security for quite a while now. And uh, we did a study in 2019 with the JSON. The JSON confirmed that, yea, verily, there are issues in research security. Research security starts with values. It starts with the values that we all uphold in every aspect of our research ecosystem, from funding awards, to proposing awards, to conducting research itself, to publishing the results. Research security is the safeguarding of these values that unfortunately are being um, exploited by some other governments, as the Jason have confirmed. Our overall goal here is to make sure that we maintain the openness of our research system, which includes principled international collaboration, but also make sure it's secure. The Secure Center is going to help with this overall. We're pursuing a JSON study right now uh, that is looking at issues such as controlled but unclassified information and other issues related to uh, research security. And a recommendation that they are going to give is that we need to create a safety culture that maintains the openness uh, in the research ecosystem, similar to uh, how we think about lab safety. With lab safety, it doesn't mean you're not going to pursue the research. You're still going to pursue the research, but you're going to create a culture where you pay attention to the safety in that research. And it's similar with research security. And our view is that this secure center is going to help in that regard. We are tasked with doing this, uh, this center through the uh, Chips and Science Act, the celebrating its one year anniversary here. And uh, there are many other research security provisions in this act as well. NSF has been given this mandate because of our leadership in research security, number one. And number two, that we have the trust of the community itself. That being said, we're very aware that we need to work together with other US government entities on this center. Uh, including law enforcement and the intelligence community. And I'll talk a little bit more about the structure as we continue on. Now, uh, the uh, National Security Presidential Memorandum 33, another mouthful, um, that was uh, fi finalized in January of 2021 with implementation guidance in January of 2022, has several requirements both for federal agencies and for the research community in research security. And again, CHIPS and Science has many requirements as well. Our vision is that the center, SECURE, is going to assist the community. Again, this is services for the community in what needs to be done in research security and in creating this safety culture. As an example, I get questions quite a bit now that CHIPS and Science says that malign foreign talent recruitment programs are prohibited if you're going to apply for federal funding. I get questions about what does that mean? Um, what is a malign foreign talent recruitment program? How can I assess what one is? As you know, there's a National Academy study going on right now with Dr. Garamella. Our view is that this center will do things like create the assessment tools to build on the study, 
that will be made available to the community so that they can assess whether something is considered a malign foreign talent plan or not. That's one example. There's also a requirement in NSPM 33 for institutions uh, to establish research security programs. And so we want to make sure that this secure center assists in the establishment of those programs through tools, information, and engagement. Again, the geopolitical environment, I don't have to tell you all right now, you're leaders in the community. It's quite challenging for research. I'm sure that you hear it all the time. You hear it in your Hill visits and in your engagement with the community. We want to say that these slides that I'm presenting today, we would love for you to be able to use them in your leadership roles with the community as well, and I'm happy to provide any further information. But these challenges for researchers and institutions, some of the examples that I previously, that I just mentioned, are things that we have to navigate together. We have to navigate together with the US government. And so what we view the Secure Center as the bridge uh, between the government and researchers and institutions. As the director mentioned in his introductory remarks, uh, we care very much about the input from the community as we form the center. We issued a DCL and got much input there. We've been meeting with many, many research groups. My deputy just met with the HBCU s and Commission, uh, which was extremely helpful, and we take that input very seriously. We've met with COGER, APLU, et cetera, et cetera, as well as many scientific societies. What we found in this input is uh, what seems to be most important to the community is information provided to them in a curated way that's helpful, not just information blasted out, and also frameworks for analysis. Again, so that we can create the safety culture to mitigate risks and still pursue international collaborations. The mission then of SECURE is to empower the research community to make security informed decisions about research security concerns. The National Weather Service, for instance, puts out alerts. Um, they uh, don't tell you what to do, uh, but they put out alerts and do analysis. And then it's up to you to make the decision about whether it's too cold outside for you to go and, and do whatever you need to do. This is similar with what we want to provide to the community, is the tools and the information so that they can make informed decisions about collaborations and research partnerships, as well as the type of research to pursue. We want to provide information, tools, and services, and also engage with the community. And our audience for this center is going to be institutions of higher education, nonprofit research institutions, and small and medium-sized businesses. Now, this is uh, what's mandated in law. We also are engaging fully with larger companies, and our vision is that in the future, after we start this center, the solicitation is out on the street right now, that we are going to form cooperative agreements and then pursue additional public-private partnerships in future years for this center to both full, more fully fund it as well as have uh, additional connection with the community. We wanted to provide a uniform quality of service. Um, something that we heard loud and clear from the HBCU s and Commission was that we need equitable access to the services and information of this center. We want to, it to reduce the cost and administrative burden of things like establishing research security programs at institutions. We want it to provide frameworks and best practices in research, research security, research integrity, and international partnerships. It will provide curated syntheses of information. Uh, many of you have seen nat national intelligence estimates, which are very well done analyses of different uh, issues and situations. We envision the center to do the same type of thing for research. And it will anal analyze patterns of risk, be a kind of hazard monitoring and detection center and provide that information out and the tools to do analytics and other an analysis. NSF has analytics tools that it uses right now. Our vision is that we will convey these out through the center for the community to use as well. 
It will not make decisions. Again, this center is a cooperative agreement with us, but it's an independent organization to provide this, these services to the community, not to make decisions. It will not be doing investigations, and it will not be forming policy. So the structure overall of SECURE, again, is the bridge between the community and the government. SECURE uh, will have a board of directors comprised of representatives from the community. We will be working together with the awardee to develop this board of directors. It will also have a U.S. government steering committee that will be two tiers. It will be a leadership tier of U.S. government representatives. I've spent the past several years building our own bridges with the intelligence community, the National Counterintelligence Task Force, law enforcement, as well as our counterparts in science agencies. So it will be comprised at a leadership level of, of those representatives, as well as subject matter experts on a subject matter expert steering committee that will be in regular consultation with the center. So, uh, in summary, the Secure Center will provide tools, analysis, information, and engagement with the community so that we can work together to create this safety culture. Thank you. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> Bar here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, all right, we have questions uh, from Suresh Babu. We're actually talking about cybersecurity, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, Suresh Babu, Alan, uh, and then Marvi. Thank you. So I really like the analogy for the alerts, like weather alerts. So if I have a weather alert, I can put on a code and go there and everything. So these tools which you are going to provide to address this, this will be provided by the secure or there will be commercial vendors of these kind of tools. So can you clarify that for me, please? Sure. So it will come out through the Secure Center, again, which is a nonprofit organization. We do envision that this nonprofit organization will engage with some of these private services to be able to provide this information out, again, in a way so that you don't have to pay for the services yourself, but that they can be conveyed out, again, in an equitable manner to the community. That will happen as well as the center itself working with the government to develop additional tools and promote the tools that we've already developed within DOD, within NSF, within other organizations such as risk rubrics and risk mitigation plans. So you will create the standards for that in a way so that we don't need to take uh, guesswork. In this. That's exactly right. Um, the, the overall approach that we envision is that it's going to be a way where we assist you for instance, in recommendations that this tool might be the most appropriate for this particular situation. This engagement that you are wondering whether you should engage in uh, happens to be in the field of AI with these particular partners. We recommend then this particular assessment tool to be used and this particular set of risk mitigation uh, efforts to be put into place, that type of thing. Again, not directing you, but again, providing you with information. Thank you. All right, Alan. Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning. Thank you for that presentation, and thank you for your leadership in this important area for NSF. I have a question that's a bit timely for the NSB regarding one particular aspect of your presentation. Uh, tell me a little bit more about the governing authority of the board of directors of this center. Thank you, Alan. Um, so the, it, the Chips and Science calls it a board of directors. If you look at the legislation, it reads much more like an advisory committee, an advisory council. That being said, we want to work together with the awardee on what makes the most sense. So when we give this award, the next step is going to be doing additional consultation with the community to determine what the best structure is. Does it make sense for this board of directors to have more uh, authority, decision-making authority? Does this make more sense for the board of directors to have more of an advisory capacity? That's then going to go into the charter for this organization that, again, through a cooperative agreement, we're going to be working together with them. So in other words, we're going to do what makes the most sense for the community through additional input once we give the award. And if I can just ask a follow-up, isn't that bounded by the, uh, uh, the recent external actions in the, in the courts? 
that's something, of course, we'll have to take into account. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Marvi and then Mel uh, and then Kayvon. So considering that you're um, creating uh, basically, a, um, I would make it equivalent to a more of a consultant body, right? Um, have you considered a potential uh, synergy with NIST and the Department of Commerce? Um, how do you then provide, you know, potential standards to the community that are in alignment to, you know, perhaps NIST's uh, recommendations? Thank you very much for that. And I think you're reading the interagency's mind because we've been talking quite a bit about whether we should have standards in research security to provide a, more guidance again to the community. I have to say it's a bit controversial. There are those who think that standards would be very helpful in research security. Here are the standards of you know, what an international collaboration looks like. Here's the standards um, that guide research integrity. Um, here are the standards that might guide additional efforts. Some think that would be helpful. Others think that it would be too directive. So what I think we need to do, honestly, and I have to say NIST is a, is a key partner with us in research security, and um, Greg Strauss is my counterpart there at NIST, and we work very closely together. Um, this is something that we're going to have to work together, I think, number one, through the interagency, and then number two, through SECURE, to get input from the community about whether they think this would be helpful or not. It also, I have to say, is something regarding standards that's an active discussion in the international space. So I represent this. United States on the G7 Research Security and Integrity Group, and we've been talking about exactly that, whether international standards make sense. So more to come. All right, Mel. Thank you. Uh, if you are not going to do investigations, how are you going to determine that your goals have been achieved? Yeah. So uh, we, we, and I should really clarify again what we mean by investigations. What we mean is that um, research security investigations for potential violations um, on things like non-disclosure, misappropriation of pre-publication research, um, undisclosed conflicts of interest and commitment, those types of investigations will not be done through the center. What will be done through the center is uh, analysis right? and the collection of information and analysis of that information. At the same time, we are going to be funding a, a new program called Research on Research Security, which is going to be funding research projects in this area that are then going to go into and inform the, the center and hopefully inform the community. Research on what are the motivations for some to do these violations, what are the overlying causes, how can we pursue these efforts and make sure that we take equity into account. Those types of things are going to be the research projects that are also going to feed into the center, if that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, the National Weather Service analogy is a really interesting one. You know, the thing about the National Weather Service is that everybody really wants that information, right? Like, if there's a tornado coming, you, you're so happy that somebody is paying attention yes. and issuing those alerts, right? Um, to what extent would you say, honestly, that the community desperately wants this information? Um, and if the answer is not so much, does that imply that there may need to be a kind of education and outreach aspect to what you're building out? You know, I think that it varies quite a bit, absolutely, through the community about whether they want this information, whether they think these issues are important, um, and uh, whether, frankly, whether they care. Uh, and so it's going to be our job through SECURE to provide, out in, provide information that is usable and that people find helpful and useful. As an example, um, there's information that's public uh, that, that um, some governments are using U.S. 501c3 nonprofit organizations as recruitment mechanisms for other governments. And they're masking themselves as, you know, an overall, you know, helpful, you know, do good type of entity. Well, that's information that I think would be useful to, to folks to know uh, and for them to be aware of and use as a kind of weather alert. And so it's all about making sure this information is helpful. 
So that also goes into making sure that we have a very clear and well-defined assessment mechanism for the center as it goes along. So we've built in that um, during the first year, we're going to be doing frequent site visits uh, to this center as it sets up. We um, are mandating that the center is going to have to have an evaluation strategy um, to get input from the community and again, whether its tools and information are useful. And as you said, we have to make sure that we have an engagement strategy. It's the weather service, but we also have to have that interaction, fu interactive function where we receive requests from the community about what they need. All right, Suresh, then Roger, then Heather. And at that point, we're going to need to wrap this up because uh, we're our break is rapidly disappearing and it's going, going, gone almost. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I, I, I considered not raising my hand. But uh, uh, Rebecca, I, I, I'm on the National Academy study, as you know. And so there and elsewhere, there are basically two types of and two ends of the spectrum. It seems like people fall on some that think that malign foreign influence um, you know, is rare and it's a necessary risk uh, for all the benefits that accrue. They do a benefit cost analysis and, you know, it's a reasonable case to make that it's a cost of doing business sort of thing. And others are deeply worried about espionage and loss and such. Um, one of the problems I hear often from my colleagues in academia is that the FBI is unable to share actual cases outside of cleared conversations. And so it's hard to convince folks how serious this is, or you know, are you just making it up? And so, um, I guess I'm wondering how we break that uh, nice drawing with the secure bridge. But it, what what does that mean, right? How do we how do we sort of uh, uh, square these two ends? And in particular, I'm also curious your reduced cost and admi administrative burden goal, laudable, wonderful, but it's really very expensive for universities in particular to put the machinery in place to handle all this. So I don't actually know how administrative burden can be reduced uh, while accomplishing this. So big question, but say what you can. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I, I think overall, one of the big challenges within the government itself, and it's in NSPM 33, is information sharing among agencies, number one on these issues, to get detailed, real information, and then to be able to provide it out to the community. I agree completely. Um, I, I, I feel that, you, you know, just to toot NSF's horn, um, we have on our research security website put several real cases on there. Um, of course, we don't put names, uh, but we give cases and details. And I think that this is something else that we're going to have to need to work through the US government uh, steering committee to do more of that. We don't want to scare people, but I think that these cases actually are very illuminating because they show, again, we are not concerned about minor mistakes. We are not concerned about uh, omissions that you forget. And, and we are concerned about real um, issues with conflicts that are causing true misuse of federal funding. And I think these cases really show it. So it's going to be our job through the steering committee to get more of that information out through SECURE. Um, you know, overall, I think uh, on reducing administrative burden, we completely understand. Um, and I think uh, it's our overall goal to do that through providing things so that every institution doesn't have to create analysis tools itself, for instance. So we can, we can put them out through that. There's still more work that needs to be done. And um, I am actually for the research security programs requirement, um, I'm advocating for a commissioning phase uh, where we have a few pilot universities who um, pursue what's in NSPM 33 um, and give lessons learned to the rest of the community. Uh, this, here's how much it really costs. Here's what we really need from you, the government, to establish these things. Uh, here's what's just not doable. And then go into the full requirements. So more to come on that. Yeah, thanks very much, Rebecca. Uh, do you see a, a, either a positive or a negative uh, impact on NSF, NIH, and others who make awards and re review and, <clears throat> and award, make the awards, uh, either directly or indirectly? I, you know, I can sort of see creeping paranoia mm -hmm. with time about, well, we should have given that award to that institution because they have a collaborator. Do you see any of that that's possible that might impede the progress of this agency? So I, 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 I think that this center is going to help 
because frankly, as Suresh Garamela said, it's not paranoia, but concern. There are some in the community right now already who are concerned. They don't feel like they know clearly what the line is to the discussion on standards. What's what's okay to pursue in research and what's not okay to pursue? What's, what, what's okay to publish and what's not publish? What's exactly. That's right. The publication side, the partnership side, um, you know, who I'm going to work with, uh, who, um, you know, who, who can I uh, accept funding from? All of these kinds of questions. And so I'm hoping that through the Secure Center in providing information out, we can help people make these informed decisions rather than way have paranoia. For instance, I can imagine um, an institution being uh, approached for a partnership with a particular entity, and they ask the they ask Secure for an analysis of this other entity, and an analysis is done that shows here's some uh, here's some research efforts that have been done through that entity that may be a bit concerning. Here are other research efforts that were done through this entity that actually have been very beneficial. So in navigating this, you know, maybe you should structure your research projects to, to focus more on these lower risk areas or something like that. Yeah, yeah. the question is really about the, the review agencies and, yeah, and how the they agencies. might use them. And, and that's a kind of a concern about for us. I mean, how sure. <clears throat> with, with rules and, and, and reviewers and program managers being at, at are they going to be at risk if they make a decision that's eventually a bad decision I understand. from a degree of secure. Yeah, so secure is, is services fully to the community. Uh, and so, um, yes, it, well, yes. And so it's to the research community itself and it is not services back to the government, right? And so the government is going to be providing information out to the community. That said, of course, we want to make sure that we, that we do things clearly. Uh, and so part of the Jason study that we're funding right now is we have appropriations language to, um, to, to develop a way of assessing are there any NSF-funded research areas that might have national security or military implications. That's a big, big thing. Right, and so the Jason are are helping us with some recommendation on that. Again, not to say don't fund this, uh, but to say you know here's how you can do this kind of assessment, and um, and if and you and still fund this and freely publish. So I think that's the kind of thing we're going to have to look at. Um, first, thanks for your work. Uh, you are in a, an extremely difficult area because you're you know you're trying to balance the need to continue to advance discovery to protect uh, the security of the country and also to protect the civil liberties of yes. Americans yes and um, and uh, one of the things that I would encourage you I, I actually think that it's that the difficult calls are not at the legal level or even the policy level they are at the implementation level um, when when you actually have to make decisions, that impact people's professional lives, their professional reputations. And in many circumstances under current law, there is no right to appeal. Mm. So the damage is done without, uh, without to American citizens uh, without any right of appeal from the big federal government. And so I think this is, this is an area where we need to be very, very careful. Um, the one thing I would encourage you to do, most universities now have to have or are developing research security officers. Um, one of the best things that, uh, that might be helpful is for the NSF to really engage in training conferences, um, getting research security officers more aware of best practices, because many of them are out there on their own and there's not a lot of good training yet. Um, and, and I just encourage you to, to look in that way. But I'd be happy to talk to you offline as well about some Thank you. I would love hard your, lessons. Absolutely. I would love your input very much on that. I agree. Uh, something we've been talking about, NSF, with our partner agencies, we're funding research security training. Um, and to me, uh, we want the training to be useful. 
But as you said, Heather, I, I, we, how much training do we all have to take? I mean, you know, and you sit there and you do it. I feel that we do need, number one, training the trainers. We need more on-the-ground training. Um, I actually have in my budget, uh, hopefully if it gets appropriated, funding for this additional training effort so that we can do what you're talking about, fund it. NSF can't do the training itself. We don't have that expertise, but we need to make, get those who have that expertise to do that. Something else that we're having a conversation with is we're having a conversation with the granted program about ways that we can partner together to provide additional capabilities uh, out in research security, leveraging that effort, and would love to talk to you more about additional input. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a quick break. I recognize that a seven-minute break is approaching unicorn status, but <laughs> let's try to do that and return around 10.05. So thank you. Session. We're going to have uh, an update uh, uh, on SAFR uh, from Karen, uh, and then we'll also have an update from Allison uh, from the IG's office, uh, and then we'll transition to closed session, and there will be some additional discussions about SAFR at that. So keep in mind the fact that there's both an open and a closed uh, uh, part of this discussion. So with that, I'll hand the floor over to, uh, to Karen Barjo. Thank you, Dan, um, and good morning. It's nice to see you all. Oh, am I not on? Oh, okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, as the slides are coming up, um, I'm just gonna start uh, looking forward to giving you this update. I wanna just start again, as, as I always do, by grounding this work in our values at NSF. Um, and we know that in order to enable scientists, engineers, and educators, to work at the outermost frontiers of knowledge, we must, as an agency, be a role model for teamwork, fairness, and equity. And investing in science as we do and education for the future of the nation requires us to ensure that there are safe environments free of any form of harassment and that we're fostering equal opportunity for all. Yes. The slides are on behind. Oh, they are on behind us. But the slides okay. are not here. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, sorry. That's, no, thank you, Allison. <laughs> thank you. All right. I can, uh, I'll continue on. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. So today, uh, the update I'm going to provide you, um, uh, uh, I'm going to say a bit more about the accountability framework that I introduced last time we met, um, go through some of the key elements that are already in place for the 2023-2024 season, um, and then talk a bit about the work in SAFR that's already moving out beyond Antarctica. Um, and I want to emphasize, and I'll emphasize this several times throughout my, throughout my presentation this morning, that we are building on the work that has already started. So everything you are hearing about today is coming on top of the work that we have outlined over the past year. Um, and you know that we have taken um, both some initial bold steps and then uh, continue to build upon those steps over the last year. Um, and we're, I'm delighted that Allison's joining me. She's going to be talking with you about some of the work that we've been doing in collaboration, collaboration with OIG uh, for this upcoming season and really looking to the future. So um, let me start with an update on the uh, NSF Antarctic Helpline. Uh, as you heard during our last meeting together, we launched the helpline in April. And this is providing the USAP community an additional avenue of support by providing immediate confidential crisis intervention and emotional support to individuals who experience sexual assault or sexual harassment. This is in addition to the on-ice advocate who is there during the Austral summer season. This is a 24-7 service, and it's provided by phone, by online chat, or text to USAP community members, and this is both current and past uh, community members. 
It's a resource that helps victims connect to the suite of our staffer support resources, including the victim's advocate, but also including the counselor, the chaplain, and the U.S. Marshal when needed. Uh, after the initial rollout of the helpline, users did experience some delays in response times for the text and online chat options. And delays were in the magnitude of 10 to 20 minutes, which were not optimal because we want to guarantee immediate uh, response and support. We immediately addressed this issue with the contractor and the response times since then have improved. In June, we conducted extensive testing which showed immediate success for text and online chat messages sent to and from Antarctica. And we're continuing to perform regular testing and are monitoring that usage closely with the contractor. And the contractor for this is Rain, um, who does provide this type of support across the US government and really across the nation. So I wanna summarize for you some of the um, usage through June. So this will uh, cover the period of, from the launch in April through June. There have been over 100 unique web page views, about 20 unique text conversations and telephone calls, and almost 40 chats. Over the last three months, we've seen the use of the helpline increase. For example, in May, the helpline received two calls, but in June, the number of calls increased to 16. So we are seeing this is evidence of both spread of and use of the hotline. In June of this year, the helpline received a total of 48 unique re outreach instances from USAP community members across all of the commu uh, communication channels, so telephone, text, and chat. And as we enter the Austral summer season with more individuals traveling to Antarctica, we expect to see increased usage of the helpline um, as more USAP community members take advantage of this resource um, and the services. Um, let me just pause there, actually, and see if there are any additional questions about the helpline at this point. Suresh. Gotcha. Are you going to go through the granularity of what those calls and chats are or not right now? I will, um, if we can save that for um, Rhonda to help during the closed session. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Uh, time has been, it should, it's, it's now just a couple of minutes. We were looking to instantaneous to a couple of minutes for that response time. Okay. Thank you, Mel. Yeah, I'm curious about the increase in usage. Can you say, or do you even know whether the dramatic increase from two to 16 is due to, for example, a single individual that might be needing more more help or whether it's more broadly based by a variety of different people with concerns or complaints? Um, we have, I am going to uh, ask Rhonda to, to respond to that because she has the, the detail on the actual usage. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you. It's, uh, these are unique contacts and it could possibly be because we have increased our communication. We're trying to make sure that anyone who's been down there or on the ice, they know where to go to, uh, that is no gap. So anytime you increase communication about where to file a complaint, you can expect a peak and then it kind of tailors off. So we think that has a lot to do with it. Thanks. Can I just ask a quick question? Sorry. Um, how many total people are on the ice during the winter? I'm mean, trying to get a scale of. Right. Um, so across um, across the uh, sorry, Stephanie, the total number of people on the ice during the winter. A little over 200. Yes, between the three stations. So that would be McMurdo, Palmer, and South Pole. But I will I will point out that the as we have introduced the hotline, uh, we are encouraging um, former USAP participants. So calls are coming in. Calls would be coming in from both uh, individuals who are on the ice, but also uh, individuals who who had been previously deployed. So that resource we have really been. Um, 
communicating that we want to hear and that this resource is open to, to former members of the USAP community as well. It would be really useful to know how that breaks down um, in terms of thinking about whether other interventions are having an impact on, on the ice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. Um, the, the last time we uh, engaged with you on this topic, one of the specific questions we had was around um, armed armed presence mm -hmm. um, on site. Is that something you'll come back to or something for later? So Allison's going to address that okay. in, yeah, yeah, thank you. All right. Um, so let me move on to, uh, to an update on the survey. Um, so uh, again, uh, we have been um, developing a climate and culture survey that we expect to launch this fall, uh, and then we'll be uh, uh, repeating the survey annually in order to to help assess and address, um, Vicky, as you pointed out, what are the impacts of the of the uh, the steps that we're taking. Um, and so we we hope to to launch this survey. We're ready to launch. Um, we this is still un undergoing review by the Office of Man Management and Budget, which is a required step for us to take in order to release the survey uh, to the to USAP the USAP community. Um, and so we're we're just uh, we're just waiting for OMB clearance on this, um, as are several other agencies who are who are also waiting to launch some surveys. Um, so we're hoping that we're going to get approval very soon and be able to do this um, in the fall. Um, we also, um, uh, Dr. Avalone, uh, who's our Chief Officer for Research Facilities, um, has been working with our other major facilities supported by NSF on their policies and practices around sexual assault and harassment. Um, I want to point out that these facilities are not directly operated by NSF as the Antarctic uh, program is. And in some cases, these are multi-user facilities in which NSF is just one of several partners. Uh, but uh, Dr. Avalone has surveyed all of these um, all of these facilities, and uh, we have uh, affirmation that within the last few years, each facility has conducted a culture or climate survey. And for the for some of those facilities, there have been multiple surveys conducted, and they have reported improvements, um, such as an increased sense of personal safety or increased sense of belonging um, and inclusion. Uh, so these are some good news, especially where we're seeing repeat or multiple surveys being conducted over several years. Um, information that we're gathering through understanding how our uh, other facilities are um, implementing surveys and then working with the results of those are going to assist us in identifying promising practices that we can then take in and, uh, and implement in the USAP community. Um, and so we look forward to continuing to gather these data um, and work with, uh, with, with other facilities as we think about best practices for, for USAP. Um, I also shared with you last time that we're developing an accountability framework, um, and OECR, um, the office that Rhonda leads, has been working with our federal partners in the U in in the USAP program, our awardees and our contractors to ensure that individuals who commit sexual assault or sexual harassment are consistently held accountable based on their most relevant organizational policies and legal standards. And this is really the steps that we're taking to try to get to a place where we have the best form of consistency possible within the various organizations that we're working within for accountability um, for perpetrators. Uh, over the past several months, the SAPR office has met with our federal partners to introduce the accountability framework and set the tone for the coming season. These are very important meetings to, to have now as we as we head into the 23-24 season. Um, and we've also encouraged our partners and have received feedback on the framework um, and um, and have suggested in response to that um, certain prevention and response strategies that have been effective within, within their agencies. So a couple of examples. Uh, for one example, we discussed their uh, other agencies' internal complaint processes and timeframes and the types of trainings that they're using uh, and what level of information and communication they need from us to ensure that they have effective communication and coordination across our work and their work. 
Uh, we also continue to share information about the support services like the victim's advocate, like the hotline, so that they can reinforce this with their, um, with their, uh, with their staff internally. We've also met with federal partners that have administrative authority. So we're looking at um, really understanding uh, and, and fleshing out the administrative authority regarding some of the SAPR reports we have received. Um, specifically, we have met with the Office of Federal Contracts Compliance Programs and EEOC to clarify what their administrative authority covers and to standardize, to, again, getting at the standard standardization of the referral process. So we are really... Um, out there making connections and having conversations because we know that there is a desire to help us with this and we want to ease the process. And we have, we have received some very great feedback, especially from the uh, federal con con contract compliance programs and the EEOC. Um, so, uh, so we've made some great progress there and Rhonda can share some additional details, especially uh, with some work with EEOC very recently. We've also been working with our academic partners um, uh, on an individual ba basis as SAPR reports come in. And I'm pleased to report that thus far, all of our academic partners have been very forthcoming, have, in have invested uh, really their time and energy in ensuring that, re that reports of misconduct in the USAP program are properly addressed. And, and then with regard to our contractors, uh, we continue to meet uh, and communicate with Lidos representatives on a regular basis. I have another meeting with them coming up just next week, um, and I'll have a little bit more of an update on on the contractor and some of the changes that they have made that have been very positive uh, for on the ground implementation. Um, and so we have been in close contact with them on their internal reporting and data management procedures, uh, really. Uh, implementing the the new contract mechanisms that we put in place, uh, looking to clarify any places of discrepancy. But uh, we have we have been working uh, very very diligently and closely with them. So turning to some key activities for this upcoming uh, uh, season. Um, First, uh, I'm really pleased to announce that um, we, in, in addition to the hotline, to the continued use of the victim's advocate, to everything that we're building on from last year, uh, we announced some new morale initiatives on the ice. And really, these are in direct response to what we heard from the USAP community last year, uh, both in in um, in in really creating a, a culture and a community that's improved for sexual assault and sexual harassment, but just in general as well. Um, and so first, uh, we heard about the lack of opportunity um, for technology to enable communication outside of Antarctica. Uh, we heard this from deployers. Uh, those of you who, from this board, who participated in the listening sessions, you heard this as well. Uh, we know that this has been uh, a request that has come in and ha has, has really been needed. And we know that this is going to also impact uh, the, 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 the isolation that sometimes leads to sexual assault and harassment. So to address this for the upcoming season, um, we will have Starlink services available for morale use, so personal use, uh, at both McMurdo and Palmer stations. Um, we will expand this use through the Antarctic Infrastructure Recapitalization Program um, so that we can make that available in the future to the South Pole. Um, so that is that is a, a very big step, a very important step for this year. Um, then we've also made improvements to our recreational spaces, again, based on feedback that we received directly from the community. Um, although the SAPA report did not identify alcohol as a primary cause of incidents, we've been considering that carefully and, and really trying to think through the use of alcohol on, on the stations. Um, and it was identified as a potential contributing factor. So um, taking that into account, along again with community feedback from last season, um, we've designated an alcohol-free space at McMurdo. And we also um, have 
pulled back uh, the ability for uh, for several other spaces um, on, at McMurdo Station to no longer sell alcohol. Uh, individuals will still be able to purchase alcohol at the station stores, um, but we have some designated no alcohol areas and have also reduced um, reduced and pulled back the number of places that are selling um, selling alcohol. Uh, we're also working on improving the drink and snack options in the recreational spaces throughout the base. And then, uh, of course, training. Uh, so last year, you know that we made enhancements to the training um, provided to both supervisors and managers and all of the USAP participants, whether they're contractors um, coming from the universities, uh, coming from our other federal partners. And we continue to build on those efforts as we move into this into this season. Um, so we are now folding in, for example, SAPA related training into safety activities. So really framing this as as a safety issue, which we know that it is, um, but including specific training, additional training tailored for supervisors um, about safety planning around assault and harassment, um, and in particular, how supervisors and managers can and should be responding um, and receiving um, disclosures that they might receive and what to do with them and how to work with the various resources that we have available to for, for victims. Um, and then we're all, we will be, um, increasing the on ice presence of our, uh, SAFR program office. Uh, so planned for this upcoming season, um, is for, uh, the, uh, our, our SAFR program office staff to visit all three Antarctic sites, um, in order to introduce the victim's advocate in, um, in the Palmer and South Pole sites, um, to work and, and communicate about the, um, education, uh, opportunities that we we have the various resources that we have, um, and of course, implement uh, some of the training protocols. Um, we have an eye towards, again, continuing to build trust, continuing to evolve the culture uh, that is there on these three stations, and um, having that physical presence is going to be incredibly important to, to carrying out this work. The victim's advocate. Um, uh, as I mentioned, will include in-person visits to the South Pole and to Palmer Station this year. Last year, the victim's advocate was only located at the McMurdo Station, um, and uh, and so we're we are um, uh, expecting that those on-site presences at the three stations again will uh, will build the education, reinforce the communication about the the different resources that are available. Um, and then um, Allison's going to talk in just a few minutes about the uh, on-ice support that the Office of the Inspector General is, is contemplating and will be implementing starting this season and moving uh, through to the future. We're very excited about this partnership, very excited that Allison and her team uh, has come to us with some ideas we've been iterating um, with Allison and her colleagues over the last couple of months um, on envisioning what this will look like and ensuring that we have the proper training and support for her staff and the proper resources in place to carry this out over, over the next year and beyond. And then finally, I just I want to end with talking about what we're doing beyond Antarctica. Uh, as as we got into this work, as we launched this work last year, we always envisioned that we would be addressing the the critical situation that was happening that came to light in Antarctica, but that we would be moving these activities beyond Antarctica to really address all scientific field work, all scientific work that's happening. Uh, so. Um, First, it, we've been having some very productive discussions. Uh, our SAFR office has been having very productive discussions with the academic community. So with specific academic institutions to really understand what the promising practices are, but importantly, where there are gaps and where NSF has a role to fill in those gaps. Uh, we had, uh, I want to cite one example. We had a, a great meeting uh, with the University of New Hampshire's Prevention Innovations Research Center. Uh, this is a, a center that has uh, that has done some incredible work um, in sexual violence prevention and response strategies, specifically in academic settings. Uh, so they are an incredible resource. Um, 
both for UNH, but but certainly for the nation. Um, their, their team is conducting research on bystander intervention, field work safety, uh, protective and risk factors, and they were able to share with us some of what they have already been learning and implementing throughout their center. Uh, so we're taking learnings from uh, the center at UNH and 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 finding ways to implement their their research findings into the work that we're doing moving forward. Uh, we will be continuing dialogue with other uh, such research teams. We know uh, that there are, there are others throughout the country uh, for which we can draw on uh, their great expertise. Uh, also, most recently, uh, members of the of the SAFR office traveled to Alaska to engage with the University of Alaska Fairbanks um, and the Tuluk Research Field Station. Uh, during this visit, uh, our our SAFR staff met with uh, University of Alaska faculty, students, um, both on campus and importantly in the field, uh, to discuss their expectations, their experiences, and their recommendations for us around these issues of enhancing safety and inclusivity of field research. So we have been uh, really out having these important meetings with experts around the country, uh, getting getting the information and gaining the knowledge that's important for us to, to think about our policies moving forward. Um, and so we're looking, we, we will continue to do these types of outreach activities um, and and then putting that into practice, uh, the SAFR office is working with uh, a variety of the research directorates on a dear colleague letter to explicitly encourage applicants to submit research proposals that will address issues of anti-harassment in STEM education and research settings and workplaces and culture change in organizational policy structure projects to create harassment-free STEM education research settings and workplaces. And so all of this is really feeding into our thinking about what we do beyond our term and condition that we have in place currently, what policies uh, we need to put in place as we move forward, um, thinking beyond, certainly thinking about Antarctica, but thinking beyond Antarctica uh, to other research settings and, and sites. Um, so uh, in sum, we've been, we've been doing a lot of work over the past several months, um, and this work is going to continue. Uh, so as we are building partnerships, as we are out talking uh, to experts, uh, to folks in other federal agencies, on campuses, with our contractors, uh, we have really seen a momentum build that we were expecting to at this point, and we're going to continue to build on that momentum uh, to, to, to further position NSF as a leader in this work. And so with that, I will stop and take questions, and, and then Allison's going to share with you some of the exciting work that the OIG has teed up. All right, Cuba. Uh, in terms of uh, applications enterprise-wide, any, um, any thoughts to potential policy changes or new policies or something with respect to, for example, this building mm -hmm. uh, or other NSF you know, facilities where NSF uh, employees work? Yeah. So, Kevon, it's a yeah. That's a it's a great question, uh, and it's one that we that we have kind of taken back to um, to to take a look at. So. Uh, I know we've done some work with our legal team on some of the some of the federal rules and regulations, and um, and do we are, are there things that we need to be doing additionally uh, for staff who work in the building? Let, let me kind of address that first. Uh, there is there's there's a, a kind of a variety of rules and regulations that that oversee the work that happens here that and you know involve no tolerance of of sexual assault and harassment. I know we've talked with this board in the past about. Um, about consensual relationships, and we do have, again, rules and regulations that govern those policies. Um, and so together, this does create a, a, a tapestry of, um, of uh, policy to guide, a, you know, to, to guide our behavior here within the building. Uh, we, we've, we, that is, we've kind of continued to monitor that, and I think as more staff come back to the building, we will continue to look for ways that we need to improve. Right now, we feel like we have the framework necessary, but always open to, to that continual monitoring and pro monitoring of that. For other facilities, this is the work that, that Linnea has been doing. So I think right now that we have a good baseline of the types of, um, 
of uh, culture and climate surveying and the improvements that our facilities are making. Um, again, we, we feel like we have a good baseline there that, that we haven't seen hotspot issues arise, but we will be we want to keep monitoring that as well. So we want to keep under, we want to ensure that those climate surveys continue to happen and there is a feedback mechanism uh, happening through throughout. All right, I see Beverly and then Roger. Um, thank you for the presentation and I'm really glad about what you guys are doing in terms of addressing comments that are made and issues that are raised. I guess my question is, is there any kind of preparatory training mm -hmm that is given to the researchers, whether it be physical or mental, um, before they get there? Yes, so Bev, great, yes, great question. And this is, so we are, we knew, we, we knew that we had to respond, but, uh, but uh, the, uh, the, such an important part of this is prevention. And we know that if we can get to prevention, we're going to have fewer instances to respond to. So yes, uh, there's there's a suite that we uh, let we launched last year of prevented preventative education um, for all of the researchers who who are on the ice, our contractors, our 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 federal partners as well. Uh, so there's uh, there is a suite of uh, of commonality in in the prevention education that anyone who steps foot in Antarctica is receiving. We continue to build on that, and so as I mentioned here, we have. More more specialized training for supervisors to, as you're noticing something, to stand in. So bystander training, both for supervisors and non-supervisors. Um, for uh, for more senior researchers, how the the um, training for them, even though even if they're not in supervisory capacity, that they are as um, ambassadors of the culture and of the science and the field work, that they have a responsibility to look out for uh, certain instances, signals and signs of um, of behavior that, that that could lead to something more devastating. So, uh, so yes, the preventative that we continue to work on those preventative processes, and that's actually something that uh, Rhonda and I talk a lot about for internally for our community as well uh, here at NSF. And training for the supervisors in terms of preventing is fine, but I guess what I'm looking at is training for individuals yes. who get caught in a situation. How do you get out of a situation? How do you protect? yourself. Yes. So yeah. So Bev that yes, the yeah, and that's part of the communication work that we're doing with the both with the victims advocate um and the helpline, but also the the resources that are available and right, and exactly that if you are a victim, these are yes, these are the types of things that are available to you. So I think we we understand that in the moment is not the time to to have that information come to you. That it needs to be it needs to be delivered to individuals ahead of time on a repeated process, so that there is not a so that they know exactly where to turn should something happen. First, I want to commend the, the effort of, of of you and your team. I, I you've come an enormous distance since this uh, initiative was in it, it was raised and. And I applaud that. I, I think it's. I was looking around the audience at, at, at our board here and and realizing how few red lights went on, or how many few hands went up because you've answered the questions that we had before. So thank you very much for that. My my question relates to how do we inform and impact on other agencies? Mm -hmm. I look at the DoD and the numbers of labs they have all spread around the uh, around around the uh, the globe, or or NASA and and how have your learnings? impacted them. I mean, if NSF is truly the leader in policies in, of this type, which is what we've encouraged throughout my tenure here at least, how, what, what do you see going on elsewhere and um, can we have a broader impact? Mm. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Roger. I think like as I, I described, like we are, and I'll invite Rhonda to come up as well because she, she has some great stories to share. We are really we are in a phase of momentum right now. Uh, I think the you know I have conversations with my counterparts. Ponch has conversations with his counterparts. We're we're both sharing and learning. Uh, we, you know we still have a lot to learn from from NASA from NOAA. But the the le like the number of discussions that we're having, the level of dialogue is um, just has. Uh, I I feel like we are we are finally at a place where 
We have some good plans in place. We're at the we like we're starting to see impact. We're we're doing well with communication. We still have a lot to learn. So we have to continue to build on the momentum. And and I think through the conversations that we're all having, we're doing that type of sharing and continuing to learn. We I would say we are still in in a in a in a stance of doing a lot of learning because we know that. Um, that we have to dialogue with other agencies and, and really continue to learn from them before we can we can say, hey, this is working or we've learned this and we're ready to share with you. So, Roger, um, I have regular quarterly meetings with our uh, other agency uh, counterparts. In fact, the other day I hosted uh, Pam Melroy uh, from NASA uh, at NSF. We're going to have quarterlies too, and I do the same with Nova, Rick Spindrad. And uh, this is a topic that we discuss at the leadership level, but more importantly, we're also trying to make sure the operational level of connections that people have. It's about, they are also saying to us that as much as they can help us with their learnings, that they are also looking forward to our work because this is something that they can also benefit from. So it seems to be a problem uh, that is not, uh, clearly not a universal solution, uh, but um, there's a lot of uh, keenness to want to learn from each other because this is an emergent problem or a problem that has not been taken care of properly, right? Yeah. So in both situations that they want to make sure that we are helpful to each other and as an enterprise, federal enterprise, that we're doing a much better job. Thank you. All right, Julia, and then I would suggest we move on to, to Alice and there'll be. Oh. Yeah. Just one, one okay. word on the operational. All I was going to say, uh, you're right, Roger, we are taking the lead on this from our inspector general who has been in contact with other federal agencies from Punch from our level and really the agencies are really listening to us. They're sharing what they're doing. So we're really taking a lead in a way that agencies are not highlighting these gaps, highlighting the dysfunction that's going on in this area. And so by us communicating, we will be able to make a difference in SAFR uh, and other related similar uh, research settings uh, that we are funding. Thanks. Yeah. Julia? Uh, this will be real quick. And well, first of all, thank you. It's really heartening to see how much progress has been made in about a year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so thank you and the entire team for that. Um, and this conversation about the engagement with the other agencies is a lead in to where I'm, I'm trying to go here. And that is, of course, the U.S. is not the only entity on the ice. And we know some of the um, issues that have occurred have involved individuals who are not um, part of the U.S. program. And so I'm wondering what your plan, I recognize that sort of comes after you get your own house vaguely in order, but um, what are your plans for engaging with the other entities? Yeah, so Rhonda's been doing great. I'm just going to turn it over to her because she's been doing great work on this. Yeah, we've been doing that, even with international settings. Uh, uh, Stephanie, is Stephanie here? Stephanie can elaborate on a meeting that she just recently attended where she was a spokesperson for our office with other um, countries that have office locations down on the ice to see how about we can have future engagement and strategy and learn from each other from McMurdo where they have locations. So we're already in the process of doing that. Uh -huh. All right, let's uh, transition to Alice and then uh, for the remainder of the open presentation, then we'll transition to closed discussion on the same topic. So, Allison. Thank you. And again, while I'm waiting for the slides to come up, uh, I will start just by thanking you all for enabling me to come and talk to you about our office's investigative response to sexual assaults in Antarctica. And I want to just start by saying, like all of you, and you've heard this from me before, um, we were rocked by the findings of the SAPA report when we had a chance to read it. Um, given what we do, we recognized that many of, lots of the behavior described was criminal in nature, but we were surprised to see that there was little, if any, meaningful criminal response noted in that report. And we recognized, in you know, based on our understanding of the law enforcement system that exists in Antarctica and the report itself that, you know, the current law enforcement structure is, you know, inadequate to meet a challenge of this magnitude. So that made us take a step back to try to figure out what 
is the appropriate law enforcement response and who should be leading it. And what we realized was that our office had a lot of real value to add in this context. So why us? Um, and why now? And why haven't we always been doing this? And what I would say is um, the current law enforcement structure was put in place in 1992. Our office was barely three years old at that time. And our criminal investigative capacity was in its infancy or even in, still in gestation. <laughs> three years, 30, three decades later, I should say, we are in an entirely different place. Our, our Office of Investigations is led by led and staffed by seasoned criminal law enforcement professionals who are recognized across the IG community for their skill and dedication. And that positions us to, to come in and add value in a way that we never could have in 1992. Um, another reason why us, in many instances where crimes occur, um, they are taken to prosecutors, people like me, investigators, take evidence of crimes to prosecutors, and some they accept for prosecution, many of them are declined. And that's because they're 24 hours a day, and prosecutors um, can only have, have limited resources, so some very worthwhile and meaningful cases can't be pursued criminally. If you're the FBI, and you take a criminal uh, evidence relating to a criminal sexual assault to a prosecutor and they say, no, you're done. My people, what we do um, in all of our criminal cases, if there is a declination, but there is, uh, you know, the underlying activity is, is, you know, is concerning is we take that through to an appropriate administrative conclusion. And we provide NSF with information and recommendations that it can use to hold people accountable. And we can do that in this context. And that is an important um, outcome because showing and enabling accountability when sexual assaults occur is, a, a, you know, has a, a strong impact on preventing future misconduct. So that is something that sets us apart. Another thing about us is that our law enforcement officers have a deep understanding of NSF and its programs and operations and strong relationships with its senior leadership. And that enables us to hit the ground running and make a difference. So, and finally, we're willing to do this, despite the extreme nature of this challenge, the complexity of um, you know what we're grappling with down there, given the distance and the many different varieties of people who are in the ice. We're willing to do that, despite that challenge, uh, despite the risk to our office. Our law enforcement folks are kind. Of, we're kind of just getting back to a work-life balance, um, given the response that we took to. Um, managing and responding to research security cases, this is going to upset that. But we're it's the right thing to do, and we're willing to do it. And we are also willing to take it on despite the, the fiscal costs that we hadn't planned for um, and the emotional costs that it'll have on our staff. So let me, without further ado, move on to show you. Uh, you know, you would think, okay, there we go, um, that all the years of education I could manage to navigate between three slides. What's that? He's running the slides. What? He's running the slides. <laughs> okay, that works even better. Okay, <laughs> so here's what we're proposing to do. I'm not going to read the whole slide to you, um, but what we are proposing to do is, you know, investigate criminal violations covered under special maritime and territorial jurisdiction, and that includes, but is not limited to, aggravated sexual abuse, sexual abuse, abuse of sexual content, and stalking. Um, so not just rape, but groping um, and stalking and all of these bad behaviors. Um, we are going to coordinate, coordinate our investigative activity as we always do with the Department of Justice and the FBI, um, with the Special Deputy U.S. Marshal, and with other law enforcement partners. And that's particularly important here, given the large number in particular of uh, DOD-related folks who are on the ground. If there is, a, is a, an, uh, an, an inappropriate behavior done by 
someone who works for the Department of Defense. That is investigated and handled under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. But our people can work with, and, and if we have people on the ground, we will be forging relationships with the people who would be prosecuting those cases in advance so that we can, you know, support the, you know, their, their taking action with respect to their employees. We are working to have an on-site presence dur um, during the summer, um, but we don't think we're going to be able to do that this coming year. There are so many things that we need, need to do in order to be prepared to deploy on site. Um, we are we are just, you know, not we don't want to we want to do this right, and that sometimes means you know that our speed is affected. But you should know that we are already receiving and responding to concerns about actions that are happening on the ice. And one thing to note is that we are always going to have to respond remotely to situations that arise in the winter. So um, part of our response will be remote. We're, what we are working at now is to making that, is, is making that the best possible and then getting ourselves ready, we hope by not this coming summer season, but the next summer season to begin deploying um, during the summer at McMurdo. Um, so uh, let me switch to the next slide. Um, actions to date, I just wanted you all to be aware, um, like NSF and what you don't see on here is all the coordination that we had done at the outset to get smart. What we, uh, we recognize that many other inspectors general investigate sexual assaults. So we started by talking with our peers to identify best practices and learn from them um, about how they tackle a, a mission like this. Then we expanded our outreach to talk with agencies that investigate sexual assaults in remote environments. So we talked to the depart various components of the Department of Defense. We spoke with people at NOAA about what happens on some of the, the vessels that, that they uh, oversee. And we spoke with the Peace Corps. Um, and we gained insights. We identified best practices and training opportunities. And we built some great relationships with skilled practitioners in this area. I'm not gonna read every bullet on here, but I'll call a few to your attention. Um, the first, the third bullet down, as I noted, our agents began responding to concerns uh, of uh, and allegations of sexual assault in July of this year. So we, we've got the stick and we are running with that. I um, mean, we were kind of building the plane while we're flying it. Um, so we are, we, are, we are not waiting for perfection. We are doing our best to respond. We've also, because of the extensive outreach that Megan Wallace, my head of investigations has done, have, has identified and recruited a, a seasoned expert in investigating sexual assault in remote environments who is onboarding right now. Um, so I can't tell you any more about her yet, but I look forward to introducing you to her when she is on board and giving you a better sense of the depth and breadth of her experience. And she's going to help us build our investigative uh, you know, capacity in this area. Um, and we are also, um, the, the next to the last bullet, because of the complexity of what we are trying to do here, um, we have a tiger team that um, is being led by Megan Wallace of my staff and Jim Alvestad uh, in OPP, um, focused on all the things that need to be addressed as we up our investigative capacity in Antarctica. Um, it, it is, it is, there are there are many many different challenges and areas and, and it, it involves not just you know people from our office and issues affecting us in OPP but OECR is a is a an important part of that tiger team the office of uh, DAX has a role because of the contracting nature so we are we are this this tiger team is a whole of NSF response to getting prepared to grapple with this problem moving forward. So, and I can't end without also noting that beyond what we're doing from an investigative standpoint, our auditors are deeply engaged in this area and they have two products that are in motion um, on this area, one of which deals with sexual assault. So you will be seeing and hearing more from us on that front. So with that, I'm gonna stop talking and, and uh, open myself up to questions from you all. All right, so Vic, then Suresh Garamala, and then Alan Stern. Thank you, Dan. 
Uh, thank you both, Karen and Allison. Uh, again, as uh, Julia and I'm sure other members of the board, from a year, wow, this is fantastic. A lot of things you're putting in place. So we really want to commend you and thank you for what you've done. Um, just a comment and then a, a question is, I also like the fact that you're, you're engaging with other agencies and you don't have to, whatever you can beg, borrow, or steal from in terms yep. of helping you, you don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel. One agency I would say, if you haven't talked to, but talk to deeply who has had this problem for a long time and dealt with it is the Department of Defense. Okay, they have had people, because you have a base. It used to be a Navy base down there. And so they've had to deal with that kind of issue many times. I want to commend Rhonda because I think we've turned her on to one resource, but there are a bunch of resources out there that you can take, as well as not only policies, but also yeah. from your point of view, OIG, how do they prosecute these things, particularly in remote areas? So I would really, they would like to help you if you want to talk offline, be happy to give you some folks in that yeah. area. Thank you very much. And we've, we've had great conversations with many people within the Department of Defense, and you're right, they are, they are a wealth of information. So just one thing, mm -hmm. one key that this is obviously policies and procedures, and I know you're putting these together, and part of this is your information gathering. But currently, just delving down, what is the current uh, fraternization consensual policy for NSF, both here and on site at Antarctica? Um, so we, I, I, I think at, at, as in, uh, all right, so I, so let me, let me try to back up and address this cause I, cause I know we've, we've talked about this, um, previously. So we, um, if, if there were consensual at NSF, if there were a consensual relationship taking place, we would, we would need to take the steps to ensure that, a super, that that the a individuals were not in a supervisory supervisory supervisor um, capacity. And if that were the case, we would need to we would need to address that finding. An so people must disclose. People, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. In 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 those, yeah, in that in that regard, in that realm, um, the same the same would carry over to to uh, to work in Antarctica. So the you know so that that is the the. You know, it's the power relationship that that really comes to focus in in a consensual relationship. And, and does that NSF policy flow down to the contractors? Does that NSF policy flow down to contractors? No, it does not. But there is a code of conduct. But there is, yeah, there is a code of conduct. Um, and so I don't. If some uh, someone else wants to jump in here, Angel or Patrick. Yeah, so the contract is governed by the contract. So that's what the contractors are governed by. And whatever uh, clauses and terms and conditions, most of our contracts, when it comes to service contracts, they have conditions on, I don't know about anti-fraternization, which is what it sounds like you're getting at, um, but there are codes of conduct that people have to adhere the, the to. The reason I only say is, one thing you might want to take a look at, particularly in future contracts, because this contract is already there. Um, in typical FAR-based contracts and even grants and cooperative agreements, those terms can be inserted. Well, yeah, certainly you, you can add clauses to contracts. But as you know, uh, sometimes that makes it difficult, right, in negotiations when you're trying to finalize a contract. But that's absolutely true. Correct. Thank you. Just very briefly, um, you know, all the stuff you've done, Karen, and your team, and great stuff. I guess the OIG work um, just seems extremely impressive. That's really all I want to say. Uh, adds teeth to it. You've stood up this um, effort. You're bringing the right experts in. Um, you can go beyond what the sort of legal, you know, criminal process uh, allows. So uh, of all the things I've heard, I must say that what you've talked about today seems the most, uh, well, very concrete and, and uh, effective. So I just really want to applaud you for that. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, um, Alan, uh, and then Suresh B, and then uh, Wanda. Okay, thank you. I'll be brief. I want to come back to something that that I asked about a couple of meetings back, which is how you're translating all these good moves in Antarctica to other NSF programs where people are away in remote locations, whether they're neon sites or, say, uh, uh, Greenland or in an observatory, uh, what have you, an ocean-going ship. Yeah, so uh, Alan, it's, it's a great question. It's a great press. So I think the the work that, that Linnea did to um, to just get a baseline of of how these the other organizations and and we know that that's even a subset of of you know field work that we fund. So we know that the that the universe is is very big uh, in in terms of of where you know where our policies could extend. Um, so that baseline that Linnea developed, that's going to help us then understand: Are there things we need to put in place, taking that that next step to to other other NSF facilities? Um, we do have. There's a lot of interest on our staff internally. So we have uh, we have a group of staff who have been working on how do we then roll past those facilities to field work, uh, work on ships, et cetera, um, even work in labs. I mean, we know that you know you don't need to like. Yes, there are particularities that that have happen deep in a field, but but power dynamics occur within a lab setting as well. So we have a group who's been quite active in thinking through how do we um, how do we start to work with the community to gather ideas, best practices, um, really hone in on what needs to be addressed, what NSF can address. So I would say that you know over the next year you're going to see more come out from us um, that's going to further our policy, um, you know the, the policies that we have, but also really thinking about new types of programs and, and putting some new things in place. But I think we're working on like what what is the it that that is going to be implemented or the, the suite of things that we're going to implement. Thank you. Glad to hear that. Suresh and Wanda. Thank you very much for the OAG efforts. And in the SAFA report, they mentioned that nothing happens for the past perpetrators and everything. So is OAG looking into that also or only moving forward? Sorry, I didn't catch the in first. The, in the SAFA report, uh -huh. they mentioned that uh, when the complaints come, Nothing happens. We don't take uh, go after those perpetrators before. So, are you uh, looking backwards also, or only looking forward? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, the SAPA report, the data was anonymized. So, from a prosecution standpoint, we can't act on anonymous data. But to the extent that people come to us now, I mean, one of the things that that um, Dr. Marangel noted is that these reporting me uh, mechanisms are open not just to current but to former employees. So if former employees come up with information about a sexual assault and it's within a statute, the period of the statute of limitations, we have the ability to engage with them. You know, obviously from a criminal prosecution perspective, it's complicated. Um, if if much time has gone by, evidence may be, you know, not there or, or degraded. Um, but we are we are open to engaging um, and it, with people, you know, in dealing with with past behavior under those circumstances. Thank you. Just very briefly, I want to join Julia and other colleagues in commending uh, NSF and uh, OIG in your spirit of continuous improvement and rapid and now accelerated uh, uh, response uh, to this very serious issue. The leadership role that NSF is assuming within the interagency context is also highly commendable. I learned a lot and was very impressed, as other colleagues have said, about OIG's new approach to criminal investigation. Uh, it's, that's, that's moving us forward. Aaron. Aaron. Yeah. The other Alan, the, the new Alan. Karen, I wanted to, um, maybe I missed it, but come back to a suggestion that Victor had proposed a while back of um, trying to clarify the chain of command on the ice, uh, perhaps having a base commander, um, but really making sure that there's a very clear and well understood and executable chain of command. 
Yeah, and I, this is something that the Tiger team is taking up because we we know that with the OIG's presence on the ice, that we 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 need now more than ever we need to be very clear about the chain of command, not to discount the the the, the significance of that. Um, that had come in. Um, but right, I think we had been grappling with how do we work with station manager versus the U.S. Marshal, but mm -hmm. that is something that, that the Tiger team is working on mm -hmm. um, so that tr that we should be able to be reporting, you know, back to you about what that chain of command looks like. Agreed. But, and I, I, I also think a management presence, and they've heard this from me before, um, but an en enhanced management presence down there is going to be critical to taking control of the culture and, um, you know, ensuring that we we get to and, and mitigate the root causes of what is leading to, among other things, sexual assault and sexual harassment. Thank you so much. If I can add, uh, that's exactly the case. We are increasing our management presence, NSF mm -hmm. presence. We have um, already approved a number of FTEs. I just want to make sure that people understand the whole picture. It says that in addition to the people that um, OIG, and we are thrilled by that, and uh, you know, uh, Alison knows this because we have talked quite a bit. So um, I think it's great to have that, but NSF uh, base commander, uh, the base commander is an NSF person, and uh, we need to provide more staffing for those people in our various sites. And this is something that we have taken very seriously also. In addition to the training, which is exceedingly important, and um, back to your point, I just want to make sure that clarification is made. What you are referring to is before people even get on the ice, and as well as when they are in the ice. That's what you are talking about. I understood you fully. And that's exactly what we are doing, is that the, these training happen people before they get to the ice, as well as ongoing continuing communication and training when they are on the ice also, that people who are going to go. And I, I was specifically referring, there's mental training, yeah. but there's physical training as well. How to get out of situations. Mm -hmm. Do people have panic buttons? Do they mm -hmm. have whistles? Do they have what? Yeah. I don't, I did so not that part, hear. So that, that part oh, not, physical training not, uh, I can tell you, but that's, that's something that we can most certainly have a conversation about. Um, so I think it's a all-in approach. I just want to make sure that this is not like this versus that, but this and that to ensure, because there was questions about what happens if there is a criminal activity? When is it a criminal activity? How are we handling that? Are the marshals going to be brought to the uh, the situation right away? Uh, is that person going to be taken out right away? These are the kinds of questions that some of them fall on the purview of NSF, as well as the OIG. And that's what we're going to be working on. The Tiger team is sort of sitting together so that we are you know, having easy, ha simple handoff between each other. That's what's going to solve the problem, um, address the problem rather, in a, in a much more comprehensive way. All right, I'm going to give uh, Marilyn the last word in the public session, then we'll transition to close. So really quickly, um, thank you for the positive uh, factors that was put in place to address these issues. You mentioned that um, some of these concerns are currently being addressed and also mentioned that you see an increase in the use of the hotline. I can't help but to wonder how many of those concerns that are being addressed uh, previous concerns and the most recent concerns, how quickly are we addressing those? This may be a good segue into closed. Um, uh, so Rhonda has some more detail on that. And if I could invite her up here. Um, uh, yeah, we have we have some additional data to share with you, but um, but certainly want to be sensitive to, uh, to to some of the reporting that has happened. So to answer what you asked us, we have heard from all categories, people who were there previously, people who are there now. And so we are prepared to uh, transition and, and talk more details when we go into the closed session. All right, thank you. Thank you both. We'll at this point transition into closed session. Just give us a minute while we uh, uh, complete the electronic logistics. Thank you.